Good morning. I'm going to start this session, Carolyn Meltzer from Emory University, and I am delighted uh, to see so many leaders here today because this is a SCARD sponsored session and uh, the session is a challenge for radiology leadership, a more diverse field by 2020. I'm going to turn things over to um, Sherry Cannon, who is a uh, professor and chair of radiology at the University of uh, Alabama at Birmingham. Thank you, Sherry. Thanks. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me okay? Are we good in the back? All right. And y'all are kind of like around the corner for me. I feel it's like I need to like, <laughs> it's kind of a weird room. All right. All right, so uh, first of all, I need to apologize. I don't want you to uh, feel like you're being slighted. I have to leave right after this talk and go to another talk, so it's not you, it's, it's pre-planned. So I've been asked to set the stage for today's discussion, and um, much of what I have to present, you've seen at various times through the week, so I'm not gonna belabor some of the points, but we'll revisit them. And the biggest thing we're going to discuss is uh, something we've already heard of, which was a report from the AAMC about the state of women in academic medicine. And this was uh, published 2013 th through 2014 data. And so there were several points that were made in this report. And uh, first of all, in 2014, a little over 730,000 people applied to medical school, and almost 48% of these were women. The number of medical school applicants peaked in 2003-04 academic year at 51%, but unfortunately has declined since that time and remains under 50%. So in 2008 through 2009, the proportion of new women faculty hires did rise, which is good, but unfortunately their departures also increased uh, concomitantly. And if we now look at the data, approximately 38% of full-time academic medical faculty are women. Now, if we compare 2013-14 to a decade earlier, we see that there has been a modest improvement from 30% of faculty being women to 38. Again, this is full-time as compared to their male counterparts. So a little bit of improvement there. And if we look at the faculty academic ranks, we can see across all ranks there's also been modest improvement when you compare to a decade earlier of approximately seven to eight percentile points for each rank and full professor being an increase from 14 to 21 percent. But this was the thing that caught everybody's attention and really made most of us cringe. And it was um, in the report, and it, it described the departments with the lowest proportion, again, of full-time women faculty, and this is for 2014. And if you look at the basic science departments, you see physiology, biochemistry, and pharmacology. Unfortunately, when you look at the clinical departments, along with orthopedic surgery and general surgery, we have radiology. Again, not one of our prouder moments. I always cringe when we're somewhere included with the orthopedist. I don't know. <laughs> so then when we look at the leadership level, and again, we kind of talk about this in the um, and, and we've heard earlier this week the concept of pipeline. We also heard the concept of, is this a pipeline problem or is this a glass ceiling problem? And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and I'll share my opinion on that. Um, so across all clinical medical, actually all medical departments, not just clinical, um, the average percentile of women department chairs is 15% and radiology is right at 16%. The range is about zero to 39%, with 100% of social science chairs being women. So maybe that should be an aspirational stretch goal, but probably not realistic. Um, if we look at all deans, 16% are women. And then if we look across um, this bar graph, the green being the current 13, 14 year compared to two prior decades. And if we look over to the right here, we see that there's been actually some uh, improvement in the number of win women in leadership positions in the dean's office. So relatively higher and improving. Actually though, when you look at the department level for the division directors, the vice chairs, and the chairs, not great. Low numbers with really modest improvement at best. So again, the concept of the leaky pipeline, and this is the leaky pipeline for all of medicine. And we see that when we look at the applicant side, again, 46% of applicants are women, 
increasing to 47% of the matriculants and then approximately 46% of residents. But then as we take the next step over to a faculty, we have a drop to 38%, and then another fairly precipitous drop to full professors at 21%, and then finally at the leadership level, in this case of deans, it drops to 16% are women. Now, if we look across academic rank, um, this report, actually, that came out in JAMA in 2015 had a slightly different number of the percentage of full-time professors as women, but I show it to you because it had an interesting um, conclusion. One of their hypotheses was that perhaps women fare better in departments that don't have as an elaborate research infrastructure. Perhaps it's more competitive for women for those departments that have higher NIH rankings and they did not find this. This was across the board regardless of the NIH ranking and the research apparatus in the various departments. So that was an interesting conclusion, and perhaps it dispels some of the stereotypes we may fall into. So if we look at radiology specifically, <clears throat> this is from the uh, 2015 workforce survey that Ed Bluth talked about earlier in this week, if you were able to uh, join in that conversation. Um, approximately 22% of the workforce across the board are women. Um, now here is the interesting thing that turned up. 31% are women for age less than 35, and when you look at age greater than 65, 10%. So visually, this is what this looks like. So what does this mean? Well, if you're an optimist, perhaps it means we are increasing women going into radiology and practicing in radiology. And we hope that's the case, and we hope this pink bar, although I will have to say it drives me crazy when you see gender bars that are pink and blue. <laughs> I, I just, who does that? So, I, all right. So hopefully that's what it means. Hopefully it doesn't mean that we have women falling off at the end of their careers, but we're not real sure and we need to dive down into this. Here's an interesting trend when you look at authorship in radiology specifically across three different years, 93, 2003, and 2013, and specifically in these four journals, the, the considered larger journals in radiology, and almost 4,000 articles were reviewed, and about 20% 20, 20 of authorship were women, approximately 25% first authors, and 15% senior authors. And if you compared it to the prior earlier time periods, we see that there is an increase across the board for first author as well as senior author. So again, improvement, but you would argue it's, it's modest improvement and we're still not where we need to be. And so a concern when you see data like this is we can't stop the momentum just because we've had some, some modest improvement we need to push and perhaps push even harder. And particularly when we look at the permanent women department chairs, right now in radiology is 16% as compared to the 15% nationally. And we heard that yesterday in the talk about radiology is doing relatively well to other medicine as far as chair positions. And it's interesting, in the last couple of years, if you include the interim and permanent chairs that have been appointed, I believe, and this is unofficial data, actually more women than men have been put in these positions in radiology, just if you look at the last two years. So I think as we go forward, that data will become even more interesting. So if we look at this leaky pipeline relative to radiology, again, modest improvements, but relative to medicine, still lower numbers. Only 27% of our residents are women. And again, if we look in radiology, 28% of our faculty are women as compared to 38% to all other medical departments. And then 18% achieve full professor as compared to 21%. And then at the leadership level is actually comparable with 16% of chairs being women. <clears throat> now, if we look here at the breakdown of our residents, again, that we see approximately 25% of residents are women. And this has been a fairly stable number over many years. And there has been a lot of discussion and actually several publications around why is this? What, what is the problem in the pipeline? And, and there are, there's a lot of literature on this, and, and, and none of it's very surprising, but some comments that are pulled out from some of the literature, and this is one of the earlier ones from 94, and this was actually just for um, medical residencies in general, not specific to radiology, but women may select specialties to which they are positively exposed. I mean, that's, that's no surprise. Um, 
And another survey by uh, Julia Fielding that many of you know about from 2007, it was a survey of medical students that were in radiology clinical clerkships. And the thing they pointed to being most important was direct patient contact as the reason why perhaps not going into radiology. And then another even more recent survey, um, again, why did respondents that were, had decided to go into radiology, why did they decide to do that? For the intellectual challenge, followed by work environment and impact on patient care. For those respondents that chose not to go into radiology, the degree of patient contact was the most important factor. And then the other two were interestingly the same, work environment and impact on patient care. And what that may reflect is just a difference in preference, for example, in the work environment. Some people don't like to be in dark rooms all day. Maybe that's it. Um, but those are some interesting findings. And I think this speaks to, and what I personally think, we do have a glass ceiling problem, but I see that as a declining problem. I think we need to focus our efforts on the pipeline because I think we can have the greatest impact there. And I think the way we do that is we need to get involved much earlier. We need to get involved with the medical students and they need to know who we are because a lot of times their decision whether to go in or not to go in radiology is not based upon reality. Again, another survey of fourth year medical students um, was interesting, and this came out of uh, some of Ed Blue's work as well. Um, we were all thinking, okay, job market is why there was such a decline, particularly in last year's match. And according to this survey, it really wasn't. Um, then some people argued, were they being honest in this survey? Who knows? Um, but if we looked at that survey, uh, again, more men than women had declared radiology at this point. And that medical schools that had a required dedicated imaging rotation, those students are more likely to choose radiology. So again, we need to develop a better presence at our medical school level. Not surprisingly, interest in radiology is correlated to role models. And then let's talk also about another report that came out after this one uh, called Altering the Course. This report was even more disturbing. And it's fairly short and succinct about black males in medicine. It hasn't changed. We have not moved the bar a bit. And this graph demonstrates on the top the orange line, kind of yellowish orange, at least it's not blue. Um, I guess they couldn't do white on a white background because it wouldn't print, right? Um, a decline in white and a significant increase in Asian uh, medical school matriculants, but unfortunately black and African American, the red line, has remained flat. And if we look at the number here, here's the stark reality. If you compare 1978 to 2014, fewer applicants and matriculants to medical school. This has been a complete failure. And why is it? Well, it's interesting. When you interview and do surveys, going into high school, there are many black males who say, I want to become a physician. But the change happens there in high school. Um, perceived barriers limited understanding about the career pathway, no role models, and that's, that's a huge one. Finances, uh, the daunting uh, length of time for the training, um, so they pursue other careers that are less intensive. So in conclusion, we've made modest improvements in gender diversity, no improvement for black males, less so in radiology, and we still have a lot of work, and again, I think the pipeline is the key. So before I hand over the podium, I want to share a personal failure and talk about kind of my wake-up call and then my aha moment. So my wake-up call happened at AUR, it was about a decade ago, when Steve Baker presented this data that was subsequently published. And at this point, I was vice chair of education and program director. And Steve Baker was talking about women in radiology and talking about the numbers, et cetera. So this was the first piece of data that went up. Not surprising. Low number of women in diagnostic radiology doesn't seem to be reflected by the fact whether they have a woman or a man program director. And at that time, I felt very empowered as a female program director. And I thought I was even more female by the fact that for two interview seasons, I was third trimester pregnant. So I was clearly <laughs> very female. And, and honestly, I thought that that was enough, that I was in that position, it should be enough. Then this slide went up. No significant regional variance. There were seven university programs that were targeted with significantly few women. Five were in the South. Two notable programs in the South. One university program that had 25 men and one woman, and another that had 22 men and two women. This is my program. This was my chair, Bob Kohler. 
This is me and my boys. Although at that point, according to that data, we had one woman, she graduated that year, and I was left with 26 guys. It was me and the boys, no one else. It was a low point in my career, and it was a time when I remember saying over and over, I will select the best person for the job, independent of race, independent of gender, independent of ethnicity. I have learned that is not enough. Not only do you have to be intentional, you have to be really intentional. And when Angelisa gave her talk the other day and showed her experience, I was blown away by that. So you've seen this book several times this week, and hopefully you heard Carolyn speak about this the other day. But let me tell you my personal story about this, because this was my aha moment that really changed the way I conducted myself. This is a great book. Part of this book talks about, um, it gives examples and gives little mini tests and talks about the implicit association test, how to reveal our personal unconscious biases. And so I'm all on board about this book. And several months back, I'm at dinner with my family. My 15-year-old daughter, who is very bright, not as bright as she thinks she is, but she is very bright, <laughs> and my 13-year-old son and my husband. And my husband and I are talking about this book. And my daughter steps in and says, I don't have biases. And I thought, well, that was interesting. And this is a child that was raised in a two-physician family. I purposely went overboard, and so did her father, to point out that women can do anything. She never wore pink when she was a kid. And, um, but I told her, I said, you, you have biases regardless. And she said, no, I don't. So I said, all right, here's a riddle. And this riddle is taken from this book. I said, a man and a son are driving down the highway, and they're in an awful car accident. The emergency responders come to the scene, and the father is dead on the scene. The son is immediately taken to the hospital, wheeled into the OR, and the surgeon walks in and says, I, can oper I cannot operate on this boy. He is my son. So I turned to my daughter and said, who is the surgeon? And my 15-year-old daughter, who has grown up in my home, says to me, well, and I was proud for a moment, he's gay, and his other dad, and he's adopted, <laughs> is a surgeon. And for a split second, I thought she was kidding, and then I realized she would, and dad, next, dad just hung his head and almost died. <laughs> then she came up with, well, the guy that died wasn't the biological father. The biological father was the surgeon. And, no, we did this for 45 minutes. After 45 minutes, I called it because we were one step away from dad that died was a zombie, came to the hospital. <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, Olivia, sweetie, mom is the surgeon. And she was appalled. I was initially mad, but then I realized that really reveals our unconscious bias. Even in the generation that grew up in a time that should have been better, it's not. So the point is, it's there. And until we're intentional about addressing it, we're not going to make headway. And as I kick it off to my colleagues, here's another book that I haven't seen as much of that I want to recommend for the men in the audience. And this book is called Why Women. And it is, the premise of the book is, if we are going to make steps for gender equality and leadership roles, it is the male CEOs that have to help usher this in and partner with us. It can't be just a grassroots effort um, for the women. So with that, I thank you and would like to turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, welcome, uh, Reed Omri is professor and chair of radiology at Vanderbilt. So this is sort of the, the southern uh, speaker circuit. <clears throat> Thank you, Carolyn, and thanks for the invitation to speak. You know, th this has been a pretty amazing conference. I, I have to say, I've learned a ton, uh, and I think this is this is one of the great things about us in radiology and our ability to try and work together and share best practices and ideas. And uh, it just continues on and on, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be a part of this. Um, as, a, as my own uh, aha moment, uh, if you will, was, was several years back when one of my colleagues in a different specialty uh, had, had actually published a paper on how they might increase their pipeline of residents. Uh, and uh, he was very proud of the, the paper, shared it with me, and it was, uh, you know, I read it, and uh, it, to me it was, it was like starkly clear that the, the answer for this specialty, it's not radiology, and we can decide which it w is based on some of the data we saw earlier, uh, 
was to try and uh, recruit women. The specialty hadn't had many uh, women, and I, I viewed viewed that that you know the answers it was hidden in plain sight. And then it it you know, I realized that um, very well intentioned and well meaning individuals may not think. And getting back to the the unconscious bias, and so um, really getting to the why. Uh, We've heard many reasons, but fr frankly, it's to, to, to have a diverse and in inclusive organization. We can call it uh, anything we want, but fundamentally, the reason, the why, is, is just it makes good business sense. It makes us better, just like we want to, to bring aboard creative people, hardworking individuals. We want to bring on uh, those with enthusiasm. Uh, having a diverse and in inclusive organization will make us better. We will make better decisions. And so I'm going to share um, uh, three uh, tactics that we have, have used at, at Vanderbilt. And, um, right off the bat, I'd like to say that it, it, embracing diversity is a core value. And you go, well, what, what does that mean? How, how do you do it? And it's, it's, it's not any one thing. It's a collection of, uh, of tactics. And in, in speaking with uh, Andre Churchwell, who is our uh, – Dean of Diversity at, at Vanderbilt, uh, Andre says, you know, it, it has to be constant all the time. It's not just some, uh, some moment where you, you, you check the box. You have to really uh, immerse yourself with this. And so one of the first things that we did uh, was assign a vice chair of diversity, Stephanie Spotswood. And, and you know, coming f uh, from an institution in the South, uh, I think this was a very important uh, thing. And it, and it, it, it sort of started uh, the momentum, if you will. Um, we then, uh, uh, Dr. Spotswood, Lucy Spaluto, one of our, uh, our, our breast imagers, uh, developed a women in radiology program, and we heard about the success yesterday of the program at the University of Washington. Uh, once again, uh, sharing of best practices, uh, this has been uh, an incredible, uh, incredibly powerful uh, group who I view as as the chair as a as a pipeline for leadership, and I I go to the women in radiology uh, program and ask how might we solve a problem or who would you recommend? Uh, and uh, you know one of the other one of the other things um, Dr. Spotswood gave out at the uh, at the end of a, a year all the all the women. Uh, Faculty members were given a, a copy. Of Lean in now. Th once again, it's it's never one thing you do. It's a, it's a collection. But really, this is a gift from the department, and I, I can tell you that the combination of uh, of supporting the growth of women in our department has led uh, a number of women faculty to ask, "Hey, how might I get involved?" If you are thinking of a way that I can participate, just let me know. Just Ask, just ask me, and and that that's just fueled so much momentum. It's really wonderful. Uh, the second thing we, we heard Dr. Cannon mention this is being intentional. Um, <clears throat> I was recently on a search committee for a chair position at Vanderbilt, uh, and I'm not making this up. Okay, so every like everyone who is applying for a chair position. There's no way at an airport interview style session that you're not going to be asked a question on what are your what are your perceptions on diversity. You know you you're going to be asked that. So it amazes me that someone can be applying for a chair position, and then literally like one of one of the chair candidates said, um, "I I treat everyone the same." There's, I don't need to be intentional about. And we're like, what? Really? You don't need to be intentional. So, so this is there's there's still this. It's once again good people not aware of their their own biases, and so you know how, how do you show that you're intentional? We, we invited Vicky Marks, who is an amazing speaker. She gave us a grand rounds on uh, on women. She's you know Vicky is full of energy. Uh, she spent so much time with us and helped us uh, enormously. Uh, we purposely create diverse teams, and what does that mean? Well, when if I ask a faculty member to lead a program, what I'll usually do is I'll, I'll say, "So, how, how do you want to how do you want to convene the group?" And then I'll ask them, "Who do you want in that group?" 
and then I'll, I'll keep prodding them and say, okay, so how have you, how have you thought about having a diverse network of thinkers? So, you know, we, we cover pediatrics and adult medicine. Do you have a pediatric radiologist on? Uh, no, I never really thought of that. Well, do you, do you have uh, do you have a resident or do you have a medical student? Well, well, why would I do that? Well, because actually they think differently. You want to include them. Uh, you know, annual diversity plans. Uh, generally, people don't rally around plans. The one thing about uh, uh, this that I will say is having uh, discrete objective uh, metrics and what you're trying to accomplish every year and sharing those uh, with the other faculty is is very helpful. Uh, this is this is interesting. So this is our conference room at Vanderbilt. You can see there's like literally there's no place to sit. This is Jeff Weil, and you're like, why? This is a Monday grand rounds. Well, what what was the topic? You can't quite see. Well, blind spots and unconscious bias. So Dr. Churchwell spoke. So what what we did is we were the first department at Vanderbilt to require our faculty to get unconscious bias trained. But how, how do we incentivize that? How do you, well, you can attach it to the comp plan. So our comp plan at Vanderbilt includes uh, uh, training in, in unconscious bias. Uh, you know, we, we have to really be intentional. How do we do it? That's one of the ways. Uh, the pipeline, we've talked about that. Um, one of the, the pearls that I was given when I initially landed at Vanderbilt um, you know, one of our entry uh, residency classes had all, uh, all white males. And I, I went to the old program director in medicine, and I just said, wow, can you please, can you please help me? What, 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 what do we do? And he said, of all the things that you can do to start building a diverse uh, residency program, the most important single step is to seek geographic diversity. So seven of those eight initial residents that I had mentioned who uh, from, were from the one class were from the s southeast. Uh, now what we've done is intentionally, intentionally sought uh, trainees from the entire country. And this, I think, has helped us enormously in, in, in many ways. And uh, there will be potentially some pushback if you're in, in the northeast, uh, you know, what unconscious biases are, are there perhaps to select a medical student from the University of Mississippi? If you're in the West Coast, uh, you know, what about trying to select somebody from Kansas? Just, you know, their unconscious biases, this, this is a way that can really, really help. Uh, Vanderbilt has a second look weekend. Uh, the medical uh, center will actually fund uh, underrepresented minorities to come back for second looks. And so we've, uh, we've engaged in this. And we've had, uh, so in two years, a total of 10 residents, we matched uh, two of them. I think uh, this, this, has been, uh, this has been very helpful. And some of you might see, uh, you might recognize some of the residents that you have matched. And I, I think that is, uh, that, that's great. Um, this isn't a radiology problem in isolated context. Went to the website for Apple. Their senior executive leadership team. This is not a problem that is restricted to medicine. Uh, I'm very uh, hopeful about the future. I think millennials do think differently. Uh, I think they generally will uh, be prone to working in teams. Uh, and I, I think we, we need to use millennials to help uh, fuel our future. Uh, I'd like to conclude uh, by saying this really is a marathon. It's not a sprint. There isn't any one thing. There's no one day we're going to have this uh, problem uh, solved. But through constant uh, uh, in intention and working together, uh, I think we have a lot of opportunity uh, to make ourselves better. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Reed. That was wonderful. Um, next, uh, wanna, we, we are going to hear from uh, uh, John Lewin, who I assume is going to speak of his experiences uh, when he was chair at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, 
Since February, he has joined Emory as the executive vice president for the health sciences and CEO of Emory Healthcare. So thank you, John, for joining us. Oh, you don't have slides. Oh. So one of the things I've learned, so. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How can you speak without slides? Yeah. Are people over there? Oh, there are some people over there who can't even see. Yeah, so, so first of all, I want to thank everyone, and it's, it's really wonderful to look out and see the room this packed for this topic. This is probably one of the more important topics um, that we as chairs, for the chairs in the room, and I see quite a few of us, are, uh, who, you know, it's one of the most important things that we need to deal with to make sure that we create inclusive environments for all of our both faculty as well as our learners so it's great to see the room this, this, this packed. And uh, what I'd like to do, and, and just a comment about no slides. So I've been now two months uh, in my new role. And oftentimes, uh, you have to get up and, and talk, and you don't have slides. I said, OK, well, I will do that for, for this as well. Because uh, when I thought, well, I could show word slides, and you could see my words. Or Reed did a beautiful job sort of presentation zen with images, which is what I usually like to do. But I actually, what I want to do is just spend the time talking to you and not have pretty slides. This is something that um, uh, is, has been a very important topic for me for a number of reasons. Uh, so I'd like to sort of share my journey through this topic at Hopkins while I was there. I was at Hopkins for 12 years until February 1st. And um, I'd done some work in, mostly in building research groups. And one of the basic tenets of building an effective research group is diversity of thought. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of data on that. You, know, you can tell, look at the Broad Institute and um, look at how they've developed it. You can look at multiple sort of good, uh, successful research groups. And that's a, really a basic tenet of diversity of age, diversity of perspectives, diversity of experience. And uh, so it makes sense that if we're going to try to create a more effective department from every aspect, um, it just makes sense to do that. There's been some good data. We've heard a lot of it over during the week. Um, uh, Sherry and, and Reed al uh, alluded to some of that. Scott Page at University of Michigan has written that diverse groups make better decisions. Uh, and how we look at diversity and inclusion is, is important uh, in terms of who we include. And so we've spent a lot of time on gender diversity, uh, which is really important. We've spent some time on, on racial diversity. Uh, but also things like uh, the disabled is a really important uh, component of our society that we don't necessarily spend as much time thinking about. Um, autism spectrum, uh, it, you know, it, it's interesting. I, there, we, we hired a, uh, a chief diversity officer at Hopkins while I was there, and I was fortunate enough to help with the recruitment process. And he made an incredible, uh, he had a, 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 made a, an incredible point. He came out of the computer sciences. He used to work, I think it was um, one of the chip makers that he worked for. And he talked about, uh, at, at one time, looking at schematic diagrams, looking for errors before these chips went to market, went to production. And he said, well, if you want to find someone who can spend hours and hours looking at detail um, extremely well, you know, what are the attributes of that person? And as he went and built up who would be the perfect person for that, it turns out someone with autism is actually the absolute perfect person for that task. And it's not that they have a disability, it's that they have an ability, they have a special ability. And as we look at our departments, I think, you know, as we look at the diversity, it's important to value each person for the unique aspects of what they bring. Um, so, so, so back to, to Hopkins and uh, diversity. I, when I got to the department uh, it, about, again, around, around 12 years ago, uh, we had a relatively, not unlike probably most of the departments uh, represented in the room, we had a, a relatively bleak um, racial diversity and uh, not as bad, but not wonderful um, diversity of, of faculty, gender. Uh, and uh, I think this sort of came to me in, in pr pretty close to my first year. I, we worked on writing a T32 grant. And part of the T32 grant is saying, what are you doing to attract diverse trainees, diverse learners into your T32? And so, uh, you know, in, in trying to put it together, I was working with a guy, Dean Wong, um, who uh, some, some of you may know. And he, uh, you know, he went and borrowed a T32 that the Department of Medicine had done. And as we looked at it, and as I read through the diversity portion of that, uh, of that application from the Department of Medicine, I realized, you know, we're doing almost nothing 
Uh, it's not surprising to see where we are. So I, I, I asked one of uh, the vice chairs, a guy by the name of Dave Usum. There is no one more effective or dedicated or committed than Dave. Uh, you put him on a task, and he will uh, die trying if he can't succeed. And so Dave, Dave uh, sat down, and within you know a, a week, we sat down with a list, a long list of, of possibilities. So the first thing that we did is we created a, a committee on diversity and inclusion. And I think it's really important to think of inclusion. I think Mark Neve said it very nicely, but diversity is checking off boxes in uh, many, many ways, and that's how many people look at it. What we really want is to provide an environment that's inclusive so everyone who is there can, can thrive within it, not just that they're, they're there. And, and I know um, for us it was a journey, but we, became, we started a, uh, a committee, and we intentionally created of not just faculty, not just residents, but it included faculty, trainees at all levels, including our postdocs and grad students uh, and, and residents uh, and fellows, but also, very importantly, staff. Um, Johns Hopkins is in the middle of East Baltimore. Much of our staff is African American in the departments, and we thought it was very important that the staff also have a voice at the table. So we created co-chairs, co one staff member, one faculty member, in, a, in our diversity and inclusion committee, and tasked them to come up with ideas of what would help uh, promote inclusion in the department. And really what we ended up coming up with um, falls basically into four different categories of, of activities that we, that we worked on. <clears throat> and these four, and I'll go through each of them in a little bit more detail, these four were, were empathy, community, self-awareness, and education. And those were four components that we felt were going to be important to drive forward the inclusion uh, process. So for, first of all, um, uh, you know, just the process of putting this together was important to have the inclusion. And again, I felt very strongly that, that having the staff there as well, so people who had only been, you know, entry level could lead that lead, lend their perspectives to what might be useful, uh, which was very different than full professors might think. Um, so I thought that was really great. Uh, some of the things we did were um, starting out were to develop a sense of community within the department in a number of different er ways. Um, one of them that was really uh, a lot of fun was to create Hopkins ethnic festivals. What we did was once a quarter or so, it was a little more frequent when we started, um, we would pick a certain ethnic uh, area in which we had faculty, staff, or, or trainees. So, for example, we had a Turkish festival. And in it, there was a history, you know, a, a po poster board with a history of Turkey was put up, traditional Turkish foods. Uh, we had some of our Turkish um, faculty and staff talk about what it was like growing up in Turkey, the, the differences in terms of the um, religious uh, environment there, you know, a little bit about uh, growing up Islam and uh, Muslim and, and living in America. And, and it was really these, you know, first of all, it was free food uh, and, you know, it was the end of a day. And um, they were very well attended. And we did them... Uh, across a, a number of different ethnic groups. Um, you know, obviously African American, uh, we did uh, India. Uh, we, we, there was a Jewish festival when I realized that there was no pictures of me from my bar mitzvah. Dave said, find a picture of you in your bar mitzvah. Well, no one took them, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, there's no proof uh, around. And, and those were very, very successful. So those, those really and continue to draw a lot of people. A second thing that we did which was really fun was um, typically during Black History Month, but we would do it at, at different times. It, it was so popular, we did it more, multiple times a year. We would take a month where we would show movies uh, after work, like 5 o'clock after, you know. Uh, we would show movies that had uh, essentially a, a diversity theme. So whether it was something in African-American culture, whether it was um, looking, looking at gay, gay lesbian, uh, you know, a, um, transgender culture. It was taking movies mostly from the popular um, movie literature but that, that address these and what we would do is we would have uh, someone um, from the community that was represented as a moderator so we'd watch the movie free popcorn free pizza again the, the, the conference room was full and then we'd have a moderated discussion and I was just amazed at the number of people who would show up uh, including some of our older faculty who you know never you would have never thought were really interested in inclusion and diversity um, came and some of the discussions were absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, 
um, someone who was at the soccer, or the the uh, South African um, rugby team game where the plane flew over. You know, just just these amazing stories came out from that. Um, we started a women in radiology lunch series, and and again um, the idea being that we there really up to then was not. Uh, an opportunity for our women faculty to feel necessarily included. And while you would say, well, that's a segregation type of thing, it really wasn't. It was, it was a matter of giving a, a sense of community, letting uh, the women faculty across the basic sciences as well as the uh, clinical sciences get to know each other, get to understand their common issues. Um, Kasha Makura, who is, uh, many of you know, um, was the president of the uh, AAWR, and around that time, right about the time I started, started was, was very eloquent about women and radiology issues, which, to be honest, I really was not that aware of, the, the, the challenges that women in radiology had. So I joined the, the AWR because it's association, you know, American Association for Women in Radiology, not of women. And I know Bruce Hillman was a member, and there, there were, I think, a, a few of us who were members to go to the meetings like at the ACR just to show solidarity and support for increasing the, the, the uh, diversity, gender diversity. The second area that we worked on was empathy, was to look at how could we build empathy within our, uh, within our faculty, within our staff, for people who were very, very different. And uh, we, we did a number of things. One of the things we did was to sort of build on the shared uh, values of people in healthcare, typically in terms of charity to others. So we started school drives uh, for school materials, coat drives, adopt a family activities, which were done, were organized, orchestrated by the inclusion committee, but were done across you know across the whole um, department, sort of to help people remember that not everyone you know was complaining because their private practice colleagues made more than they did. Right? Some people were trying to put food on the table and have a warm coat. To wear, and I think that was really an important activity to help ground people. Uh, we had Habitat for Humanity outings as well, sort of the same idea of trying to let people know that, remind them of why they were there and why they were very fortunate for what they did. And uh, we had a really interesting and in, uh, such of speakers during Black History Month, uh, including Levi Watkins, who was the first African American student to graduate from Vanderbilt. Uh, Vanderbilt uh, Medical School, and he had a great story. He unfortunately passed away uh, the last year, but he had a great story. He's a very light-skinned African-American gentleman, and uh, he remembered uh, looking at the picture. He was like at the first day of school. They had a, you know, they had everyone's pictures up, and uh, um, you know they were all sitting there, standing there, looking at it. And and a couple of the students were saying, "Yeah, can't believe we got one of them with us," you know. And I wonder, wonder, wonder which one. You know, I, I wonder. Uh, when, what he's going to be like, and, and Levi was standing right there, and it's like, yeah, it's hard to believe, huh? You know, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, it's very, very fascinating story. So we had Levi, we had uh, Mike Harris, who was our head of engineering, physicist, uh, engineer, did, uh, did all of our maintenance, talked about his experience uh, being in Vietnam as an African-American soldier, and the fascinating experience of, in Vietnam, um, there was complete inclusion. His, his white, the Asian, the, the African-American soldiers felt complete ease with each other. They watched their backs. They were a, a family. And then coming back to the U.S., the shock of being sort of immersed back into a segregated um, you know, a, 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 and biased environment. And that, again, we had a long discussion uh, after each of these with a number of different primarily African-American um, pioneers in different ways. With regard to self-awareness, um, many of the things you've heard before, we've also, we also did. We, we had implicit bias. Um, we had people from the Harvard implicit, in, implicit uh, bias group come down, administer the test. I was not as, um, I guess, proactive as Reed in terms of linking compensation to it. Um, so it was more voluntary, but there was quite a bit of interest in it, quite a good crowd for that. We also, um, interestingly, had a debate on affirmative action. We got the Hopkins debate team to take pro and con affirmative action stance. It was just after the University of Michigan uh, affirmative action uh, court case. And it was, it was fascinating to sort of hear that, you know, and actually we had African-American debaters 
debating it. That, that was a really fascinating uh, thing. And there's a guy by the name of Pierre Forney uh, who wrote a book on civility. And we actually had him come and do a, a, a symposium on civility in the, in the, in the department. Um, because, you know, what, uh, civility is really the foundation for uh, an inclusive environment. And when people are racially biased or ethnically biased or gender biased, it, it, the, fundamentally they're not being civil. So it was, it's sort of taking not from the, the um, necessarily the diversity inclusion perspective, but just from the being a good human perspective, we had him come and, and talk. And then lastly, um, we, we tried to do some educate, more sort of strictly educational um, activities to try to teach the staff and faculty uh, more about each other's cultures. And so we had a speaker come on the medical care of Muslims, unique features. And it was fascinating because someone who went through, you know, why do people wear the burqa? What are, you know, what are the different things of Saudi? We, have, we had quite a, a, a large Middle Eastern patient population. Uh, and it, it was just a fascinating to learn. I learned a tremendous amount. And then the discussion afterwards was interesting because we had some Turkish uh, faculty members who felt, felt very strongly about headscarves. And, and, you know, the, it felt very much that this was, um, that, that there were aspects of, of Muslim culture that, that they found very biased. And that we had a, it was a really healthy and strong debate. Um, we worked uh, hard to host people from different countries and have them typically speak um, less formally to faculty and staff. We even had a, a retreat on Toltec uh, wisdom uh, and the philosophy of, of our American her Indian heritage, uh, Native American heritage uh, as well. And the, uh, the upshot of this was for about 10 years, um, 11 years, we, we've had a very healthy inclusion and diversity conversation. And I just want to share a story about um, where that paid off. So as some of you may have seen in the news last April, uh, about a year ago, uh, there was a, an unfortunate young man by the name of Freddie Gray who was arrested for not much of anything, um, which is not uncommon, unfortunately, in the city of Baltimore. And the problem was that um, he did, you know, probably resisted arrest a bit in terms of uh, what he was doing. He had been known to, um, you know, mimic injury before, and he'd been arrested multiple times. And the, the police threw him in the back of a, of a, a, a van without a seatbelt, sort of gave him a tough ride, it sounds like, uh, most likely, although that will be proven in court whether it happened or not. He unfortunately, in, during that ride, broke his neck, ultimately died. There was a delay in getting medical care because the police who were checking on him really didn't believe him that anything was wrong, uh, and, and he, he died. And it's a story that's far uh, tragically too familiar to us in, from different cities over the last you know, decades, but certainly the last few years. Um, so we, after this uh, occurred, uh, after the funeral, there was quite a bit of unrest. The, the neighborhoods that, that Freddie were fr was from, um, there are people out on the streets. Uh, and unfortunately, given you know, the opportunity and the police being overwhelmed with crowd control, um, there are a number of people uh, broke it, vandalized, uh, burned a few things, burned a few cars, burned a few stores. Uh, and and it, was, it was characterized on CNN as a huge riot. In reality, there was probably a four block area where most of this occurred in Baltimore, with, um, which, which was terrible, but it was not. They showed the same um, images of a burning car every 20 minutes on CNN and made it look like there were about, like that, the city was in flames. It wasn't, but it was a serious, a serious issue, and it was a serious um, uh, problem for the department, which is, is quite diverse in terms of its staff in particular. And the, the, the next morning, um, we got together with our leadership uh, hospital and, and some of our faculty leaders as well. And our staff leadership is about, was about 30% African American, um, more than half women, and uh, you know, taken pretty representative of the workforce. And we, did, we worked hard to make sure that was true and talked about what could we do um, to, to address this? What should we as a department do to address this? And what was absolutely fascinating is speaking with the African-American managers, some of the stories that came out, um, I think made most of us cry. Uh, we had one 
wonderful um, manager who told the story. He said, well, I've never even told my wife this, but I was driving into work um, like, you know, a couple years earlier, and I must have matched the appearance of a perpetrator of, of a crime. The police got me out, you know, stopped me, asked me to get out of the car, said, get down on your knees, um, and it was snowing. And he said, you know, very politely said, I, I'm on my way to work. I work at Johns Hopkins. I'm a manager in the radiology department. Get down on your knees, you know, left him there for 20 minutes on his knees before coming and saying, okay, you're not who we're looking for. Let him go. And he just said the humili you know, humiliation of that um, was such that he couldn't even tell his wife. And he was, he was in tears telling us about that. And the stories around the table were, were, were similar. So we thought, what could we do? To, what could we do as a department to try to move this forward, move, you know, to try to heal? Um, so we started, we, we created a series of town hall meetings, one an hour for uh, seven contiguous hours the next day, with the um, statement to the department saying, if you, you know, please let any of your employees who would like to attend, please let them attend at least, you know, one of these town hall meetings. And... Uh, during those meetings, again, I, was, I, I wasn't at all of them, but I, the ones I was at, unbelievable stories. We had, we had people whose husbands uh, were police officers talking about the struggles of trying to be a police officer in this environment. We had a number of people who grew up in the same neighborhood as Freddie Gray talking about the number of times they had gotten arrested for looking, you know, looking at a, a policeman the wrong way. And, I, I, you know, you could say, well, sure, but in fact, I, it, I, I, I have no doubt that that was true. Um, they talked about sort of seeing, you know, one person had an, an in the intake, uh, jail intake area, had a seizure, fell down, and the police just left him there seizing. Didn't even go to, to help him. You know, some of the other people who were being arrested tried to help him uh, off. You know, it's just unbelievable stories, lots of tears. Um, and it really showed that the work we had done to create a community paid off because um, while there were differences of perspective. Um, everyone was willing to listen. And actually, based on that, the, you know, one of the comments I made to the group was, you know, we, we in radiology can, can, have it, can change the culture here at Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins is the biggest employer in the state, can change the conversation in the city and the rest of the state. And it's our, it's our responsibility to do that. And in fact, the dean heard about what we did and rolled out a similar set of town halls across the uh, across the school of medicine based on that so i think you know again just to um just to, to summarize the idea of, of uh, inclusion and creating an inclusive environment goes beyond just the faculty it does go to our staff it goes to the whole workforce and the work we put into that is is um tremendously will, will pay off greatly again with regard to faculty recruitment you know, I'm proud that in my last couple of years, we recruited three African-American uh, faculty members, which a, on the clinical side, we, we, we had a few on our research side, but which greatly increased the numbers because we were sadly, uh, there was a, a period of time where we had no African-American faculty members. Um, our women recruitments were uh, around 50-50 with men moving forward. And I'm very proud that um, we were able to promote more women during my time, uh, to full pro my time there to full professor than had been promoted during the history of the first hundred years of the department. Um, and it's a matter of looking at people who had been passed over by prior, prior chairs just because they didn't come knocking on the door saying, hey, when am I, when am I, when am I gonna be a full professor? Um, which again, from lean in and some other things we know is not that, it's a difference in behavior uh, expectations often between women and, and men faculty, but by going and saying, hey, would you like to be promoted? So of course I would. Uh, and it was really fantastic to see that as well. So I, I look forward to the, uh, the rest of the conversation, but I just wanted to, again, share our journey. And there were plenty of failures as, as um, Sherry mentioned as well. But again, here are some of the ideas that seem to have worked. Uh, and I just wanted to share them with you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, John, for that uh, powerful presentation and without slides. Um, I think some of the ideas that you mentioned of things you've done in your apartment are fantastic. Um, you also bring up the important point that we can't isolate what we do in our departments from our communities. And uh, whatever your politics are, this is a time of, 
a lot of explicit bias, um, and and we have to think about how that affects our our faculty and our staff. Uh, in Georgia, we've had um, thank goodness it was vetoed, but there was a bill on the table to uh, to pull back anti discrimination uh, laws protecting the LGBT community, and the university took a strong stance, as did many businesses, and and made a difference. So I'm going to now invite uh, Alex Norbash, the uh, prior chair of radiology at Boston University, and he's responsible for hosting us in San Diego uh, as the current chair of the department here at UCSD. Thank you so much, Alex. Good morning, everyone. In way of disclosures, I'm a scientific advisor to Stryker Incorporated for a multinational trial. I'm the chair of the DSMB, and I'm a co-founder of an imaging core laboratory in Boston called the Boston Imaging Core Laboratories. It's been in place for nine years. Um, I'd like to share with you some sentiments that I have in terms of my experiences uh, as uh, assistant dean for diversity at Boston University for five years and um, how that influenced my perspective as a chair. So I'm not going to talk too much about the larger system. I'll talk about the departments. And I'm, I'm again, this is going to be to some degree redundant in terms of talking about motivation and value of thinking about this space, so please indulge me. First thing I do when I wake up after I hit my uh, snooze button five times is I look at the New York Times online before I get out of bed. And so this is from this morning. It has to do with something strange that Susan Sarandon said on MSNBC. She said there are a number of Bernie Sanders supporters that feel so much antipathy towards Hillary Clinton that they feel that voting for Donald Trump might be better because it will force a sea change. And so that's why the article is called Bernie, Bernie or Bust is Bonkers. And Charles Blow is a very eloquent African-American gentleman who writes great editorials in Wall Street – I'm sorry, in the New York Times – um, and so one paragraph that he put in there is he was building this understanding for us of what a durable legacy is and how dangerous it is to put the wrong people in positions of power. Um, Obama has uh, appointed around 270 judges or been instrumental in the appointment of them. And, and of the judges that have been appointed, 36% have been minorities compared with 18% for Bush and 24% for Clinton, uh, and 42% have been women. So the point – that's being made is that when you look at the downstream legacy and influence of making the right decisions, now it's significant. And the longer you wait, the less good you do. So there's, there's a reason to be direct, forceful, and timely in terms of changes that you choose to implement. And in fact, some may argue that this could turn out to be Obama's greatest legacy in terms of the influence that he holds for the next 40 or 50 years with the judiciary and how that will affect uh, our state of being. Francis Galton is on your right. He was a half-cousin of uh, Darwin. He lived from 1822 to 1911. He's an interesting man. He was a meteorologist, a brilliant meteorologist. He was a polymath. He was a social scientist. He was an anthropologist. He coined the term eugenics. He did a lot of stuff. It's kind of interesting to read about these brilliant people from way back when. And he went to a state he went to a county fair in England. And at the county fair, they had an interesting raffle. There's an earthenware jug, you'd write your estimate of the ox's weight, you'd drop it in the jug. On a given day they pulled out all the estimates and your name would be next to your estimate, and they would call off the name that was closest to the true weight of the ox, and you got to go home with the ox. <laughs> kind of an interesting party favor. So Darwin watched the proceedings, and uh, again, as I mentioned, he was a, a, a mathematician, and um, he took the earthenware jug home, and he spread out all the numbers, and he did a bunch of different numerical calculations. The true weight of the ox was 1,198 pounds. Uh, the median was 1,207 pounds, and when he looked at all of the numbers and he regressed to the mean, it was only one pound off the true weight of the ox. So that's when he generated this concept about the wisdom of crowds. And there's a famous book that's out, a management book that's out about it. And, and so when you think about the wisdom of crowds, there are several elements that play into it. And I think they're central 
to what we discussed with diversity issues. And I'll be, I'll be pretty specific. So imagine at this county fair you've got 2,400 entries. And uh, the, the people who are making the entries, it could be a homemaker, it could be a baker, it could be a dairy farmer from dairy, <laughs> it could be a butcher from Dover. So you have a lot of different opinions, a wide variety of opinions. And some of them are crazy high, some of them are crazy low, and a lot of them are aggregated in the middle. Now, so you've got a diversity of opinions, but you also have a communication method, and that's writing these things on a piece of paper and putting them in an earthenware jug. And you also have an intention, and the intention is to go home with a party favor and guess the right way to, uh, of the ox. So when, when we think about what we're doing in terms of the diversity space, um, we're not just interested in diversity as an ends in itself. We're interested in diversity as a vehicle for innovation, creativity, and improving public health. Why is that? Because we need to create communication channels that don't just bring in diverse individuals, but allow them to freely exchange ideas. And so the key isn't just bringing in diversity, but it's also enabling their voices and allowing that interchange of ideas that doesn't often take place in a polarized society. So it's not about recognizing factions and factionalism and representing for your faction. It's about respecting the full spectrum of diversity that exists in order to potentiate creative conversations. And just as John said, um, the president of uh, the University of Pennsylvania, um, Amy, I'm blanking on her last name, has mentioned that the foundation for any civilized society is respectful disagreement. And we're moving away from that as a society, aren't we? So the ability to sit down and disagree with somebody and walk away with respect for the corollary point of view, that's what we should be creating. That's what we should be enabling. So it's about conversational systems. It's about engagement. It's about putting various factions together and having them work as integrative teams. I think that's the destination that we're looking for. Uh, there are a couple of epiphanies for me, and I'd like to see a show of hands. How many people in the room were dissatisfied with maternity leave policies applying to themselves or to their spouses? Small number? Okay. I think some of you are being shy. So I'd like to share a story with you. My wife had twins when she was a first-year surgery resident at a prestigious program. Um, and um, she wasn't treated fairly or well, in my opinion. She, she had early rupture membranes. She had to be on bed rest for five weeks. When she went back to work, they said she could only have two weeks off service. Um, and then they also stretched her residency by several months. The conversations were intermittent. She had the sense that um, the residency was very misogynistic, and the stories that she shared with me were unequivocally misogynistic. And so that's one little vignette that stuck in my mind. So I had this empathy about what my wife went through by dint of having lived through it and seeing the, the pain it caused her. Now, when I think about the effect of that in terms of her perception of that organization, the amount of energy that she invested in this anger and this disappointment, how it changed her for a period of time, it's a significant impact. When I extrapolate from that to a societal level, it's a significant impact. It's, it's an opportunity cost. It's dramatic. So this has always been rolling around in my head. Um, when I was a chair, I was a chair at Boston University from 20, 2004 through seven months ago. And about six years ago, I was speaking with a chair of ENT. We were talking about our budgets. And we were walking down the street talking about our budgets. And he said, you know, my budget's really, it's, it's a problem this year because I had a couple of people going on maternity. And I asked him, well, why is that a problem? He says, well, there's no institutional solution to it, and there's a lot of variability between departments and how they handle maternity leave. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? I, he said, what do you do for maternity leave? I said, well, we pay full salary. He said, well, how much time off do you give them? I said, well, we give them as much time as, until they have to go into FMLA, and I believe it's four weeks, and then they can take additional time as necessary. He said, well, not every department does that. So that was the reason for our starting a physician organization at BU. That conversation turned into a roundtable we set up as, as chairs. And so, again, in terms of tools, I think you have to be mindful of unfairness. You have to be organized in terms of how you structure 
an opportunity to address them and you have to communicate and network and understand what others are doing and then you have to share that understanding to repair the system. So one of the first things that we did as a physician organization was come up with a cohesive approach to um, child care leave, whether you're a mother or a father and the other related issues that have to deal with that. So it's interesting how powerful these individual engines of frustration can be if you harness them appropriately, and, and that was a circumstantial, that was not intentional. So Sherry mentioned briefly about uh, overcorrection. Uh, if you're in a car and you're swerving and you're heading off the road, you don't just straighten the steering wheel, do you? You don't just straighten the steering wheel because you'll go off the road in the opposite direction. So you'll notice in this illustration you have a car that was swerving to the left, swerved to the right, straighten the steering wheel is going off the road. The issue is that continuous course adjustment, adjustments are necessary. If we realize there's a problem with diversity, it's going to take a disproportionate amount of attention right now as long as the reason is correct and the assets are appropriately levied. And then at some point in the future, we can decrease our attention to it. But you have to overcorrect initially. And then you gradually modulate your response to be appropriate. So you need data. You need information. We need to collectively put our heads together and address this particular space. And we talk about why diversity should matter, but I think it's really reduced to individual stories about when each of us have felt misunderstood or out of place or threatened. And so we have to extrapolate from that to get the perspective of the other individuals who are around us who also see themselves as part of diversity spectra. We talk about social justice. It's the right thing to do. I think we, we understand that. We talk about intellectual biodiversity and the need for that. I'm an interventional neuroradiologist. My specialty is under fire and may disappear within 10 or 15 years from the domain of radiology because the neurosurgeons believe it's theirs. The neurologists feel that stroke is theirs. Now, do you believe that I and five people exactly like me, people just like me who are interventional neuroradiologists sitting in a room, do you think we have a better chance of solving that problem or do you think we have a better chance of solving that if it's a couple of interventional neuroradiologists, maybe a cardiologist, maybe a nuclear medicine physician, maybe a molecular imager, maybe an ultrasonographer? Do you think that's a better group to solve the problem? How about if you add a couple of administrators? Or what if you add a race car driver? Or what if you add an artist? So intellectual biodiversity is beneficial because it bootstraps creative innovation. And that's what we're looking for as a specialty, and that's what our foundation is built on. And then finally, and there are lots of reasons, that's why I put in dot, 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 there's the patient perspective. When I'm the chair of a radiology department at a safety net hospital in Boston, and most of our departments, if they're white males, and the patients are African American, or West African, or Caribbean, how do they feel about looking up and seeing somebody who does not understand their shared culture and their shared perspective and doesn't speak the same language and doesn't know where they're coming from? Aren't we there to cure mind, body, soul, and spirit? How can we do that if we don't understand the patients fully? We do that by having other individuals we work shoulder to shoulder with who do and have the cultural competency and have an understanding of what the patient needs in order to be cured and healed. And there are many different kinds of intelligence. It's not about taking the 10 smartest radiologists, putting them in a room, and having them solve the problems. There's linguistic intelligence, interpersonal, in extrapersonal, existential, moral, naturalistic, spatial. And so when you think about the diversity of thought styles, you're interested in individuals who possess these various skills. You know people who are very eloquent. You know people who are very disciplined. You know people like John said who might seem autistic, uh, but yet they have a certain level of brilliance in a different space. Did John say that or somebody else say that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, so, so there are a number of line items that you, you think through in terms of your own philosophy and motivation, and that's important at a, at a departmental level to understand what kind of a message can carry given your department and given the setting for the department. I think we all also need metrics. We need measurables. We need an understanding of where we are. Otherwise, we have no speedometer in the car. We need to assess the environment. In my particular case, I was very fortunate. Um, the CEO of my hospital was a woman. Uh, my, the dean of my hospital was, was a wonderful woman who was just a pleasure to work with. And we had a very strong um, group of assistant deans for diversity and an associate dean for diversity, and we worked together very well. So the institution was supportive. But the institution has to be supportive for you to be able to make effective changes. 
we had to create a strategy and we, we had to be able to frame and communicate it and we had to evolve understanding that life is iterative and everything's an experiment you have to be willing to fail but you have to take chances otherwise you're not moving forward now one of the central things that we did uh, Eva Kuligovska was a former uh, president of the AAWR and she was very eloquent very attuned to this concept space and so you look at your assets you look at the individuals that you have and you empower them as much as possible if you have junior faculty who are women who are tremendously promising you tell them that on the front end you say I see remarkable promise in you we need to cultivate this potential I need to pair you up with another mentor in the organization maybe not even in the department who can m fulfill your ambitions and give you a sense of direction. So what we're doing right now, Roz Dietrich at UCSD is putting together a very elaborate mentoring system and structure that we're going to start implementing uh, that, that's built on the back of recognizing that mentoring is critical. Role models are essential and they don't necessarily have to be in your own department. You also have to look at sectional staffing plans and develop a formal sectional staffing plan. So for example, if I'm looking at neuroradiology, I need to understand what the leadership potential is in there and what vacancies are going to happen in the next several years that should be filled, and I need to start scouting how I can fill those vacancies with diverse individuals from other institutions who can bring in other thought styles. And again, as Reed mentioned, uh, if you continue hiring your own graduates, you're going to have another echo chamber. Uh, intellectual biodiversity is really, really essential. So when we're talking about diversity, like with everything else that has a high level of prioritization, it has to be front of mind all the time. It's not something that can be occasionally pulled out and addressed. It has to be front of mind as you're thinking about a host of other issues, whether they're budgetary issues, whether they're manpower issues and staffing issues or cultivating or educational issues. So it's, it has to be in the front of mind. And also, it has to include right and left brain components. It has to involve sociology, it has to involve conversational skills and aptitude engagement, but it also has to involve analytics and structure. So that triangle has to exist for you to be able to succeed in this space. Etta Pisano and uh, Lars Grimm, Jennifer Neo, and Sura Yoon um, wrote an article that's on AGR online right now. I, I, I got an announcement about it about a week ago. Reviewing 51 major academic radiology faculty rosters, showing that 34% of academic radiologists are women, but only 25% of vice chairs and section chiefs, and 9% of department chairs are women. So I, I looked at a sheet we had from 2009 to 2010 after we tried to intentionally put a, a certain number of women in position. This is Eva, top left. So we had 47 total clinical faculty. Underrepresented minorities were 6 out of 47, which is 13%. Women were 15 uh, over 47, or 32% of our total faculty. And when you looked at the breakdown, underrepresented minority leaders, which means section head or vice chair, were 24%, women leaders are 35%, so combined we were at about 53%. So the metrics are important, but it's not a matter of patting yourself on the back. In my opinion, an overcorrection is necessary because we don't have enough role models and we don't have enough inspirational examples. So what I think, what I'd like to suggest is the following. We know we can do more as a group. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, SCARD, in my opinion, what we should be doing is establishing uh, expectations and standards for maternity leave that we all take back to our organizations. We talk about best practices, and we, and we do the right thing with family leave. Um, and, or, as an example, one of the biggest pr challenges that I think we're facing on the gender inequity side is a disproportionate number of women are part-time because they're responsible for child care issues, and the, the man, like me, abandon their responsibility and kind of leave it to the women. And so um, the result is they're not promoted on time. They're not promoted on schedule. I think we have to address this collectively. We have to go back to our organizations, and we have to embarrass the places that aren't doing well to follow best practice. So we have to be more of a force for mobilizing positive change, and I think we can do that in this particular space. So again, in this fall, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to put something together to start sharing information about family leave. We need to come up with a national standard that we agree on as a reasonable way of doing it. So you have to consciously engineer the future. It's not something that you want to accidentally happen because you do have control over this, and this domain is deserving of attention. Now, <clears throat> this is my last slide. Sometimes I'm disappointed by uh, my, my lack of command of the English language. Uh, I was going to talk about how proud I am for us in radiology to be bellwethers of change where diversity and gender inequity is, is concerned. And uh, so I thought, well, bellwether, that seems like it's the right word. 
So I was going to feature bellwether prominently, but I learned something unfortunate about it, so I'll share it with you. So bellwether comes from two different words, bell, the ding-dong bell around the neck from Middle English, and weather, uh, which is this sheep. And the bellwether leads the rest of the flock to pasture. So why would you put a bell around one particular sheep and, and have him lead the flock to pasture? Well, because this, this sheep is only interested in feeding and isn't distracted by the other sheep <clears throat> because it's emasculated. So that was the first unfortunate realization. So it has no motivation other than just eating. And then the second thing, which is even more unfortunate, is uh, you may know this, that uh, bellwethers, these sheep, are used to, to lead other sheep to slaughter in slaughterhouses and are spared typically. So in terms of the common usage of bellwether, you may think you want to be the bellwether, but you've got to be careful. <laughs> Language matters and look at the details always. <laughs>